Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We are delighted to have you back with us again as we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians, an encouraging study, an encouraging book. And we're taking a look at it week by week, study by study, verse by verse. This week we're looking at Lesson 7, The Unified Body of Christ. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for being with us as we study the book of Ephesians and as we continue to delve its depths, we ask that you will bless us with a deeper understanding. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're grateful that you're here and Dr. John McVeigh, we are grateful that you are here with us again, the author of the quarter Sabbath School lesson. You are currently serving as the president of Walla Walla University. You sound like you're a fairly busy individual. (laughs) Well, it's been wonderful to carve out time over the last years to, to work afresh on Ephesians, uh, Sabbath School Quarterly and the Companion Book and so on. And uh, wonderful to be here with you, Eric. And we're having fun delving into this and, and discovering new things and, and opening our minds and our hearts to new and interesting truths and possibilities. So a fantastic journey. And here we are now on lesson number seven. Yes. Lesson number seven of 14. Mm -hmm. So we're getting close to halfway. Yes. By the time we're done today, we'll actually be halfway. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully not halfway done with with a complete study of the book of Ephesians. (laughs) Oh, we're just we're just actually scratching the surface. But uh, it's it's fun to study this together. It really is. This week, we're looking at the unified body of Christ and Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking specifically at chapter four, the beginning of chapter four, uh, verse number one, we see a shift in focus. We've been looking in one direction up to this point, and now in chapter four, and there's only six chapters in the book of Ephesians, so it's a relatively short book, but here in chapter four, something happens, something shifts. What happens here? Well, in in chapters one to three, Paul has been unpacking some uh, really wondrous theology, hasn't he? it's been a, a, a God-focused, Christ-saturated, spirit-inspired letter to this point where he really is unpacking the grand plan of God to unify everything in Christ and how that's especially focused on God's initiative through Christ in creating one new humanity, which we call the church. So he's been unpacking this this glorious theological trail through the first half of of Ephesians, and it's been a wonderful trail to to trace together. But then in chapter 4, verse 1, as is true of most of his letters, the the focus shifts. It's not that there's no doctrine here. It's not that that same wondrous theology isn't in view, but he gets down to the nitty-gritty of Christian discipleship. How does all this wondrous, high-flown, heavenly places theology really impact the church in its life and church members in their lives together. Where does the rubber meet the road? And we feel that, uh, that change signaled in chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So after an introduction like that, you're going to expect some advice, some counsel about how to live. So now it's, it's not so much the lofty, it's okay, now what about you? Where the rubber meets the road, where the boots meet the ground, yes. the day-to-day life, what does this look like? So as we read down through the next, well, several verses, if we're not paying attention, it can seem perhaps a little disjointed. Yes, it can. But it can. Paul, though he writes some things, as Peter says, that are difficult to understand mm-hmm. at times, he does have, he's led us up through the first three chapters to see that he has the themes and yes. goes from point A to point B to point C. We wouldn't expect him here as we get to chapter four to just lose that train no. of thought. No, he remains very organized in his thought. And in fact, uh, though he now turns to advice and, and counsel directed toward how we act and behave as disciples, particularly together in the church, there's still a good dose of wondrous theology here. He's going to give us a new picture of the uh, uh, exaltation of Jesus, harking back to the end of chapter 1. You remember when we studied the exaltation of Jesus there and this, these four historical events and uh, Christ being enthroned with the Father and, and so on. 
he's going to give us a fresh picture of the exaltation of Jesus. So even though it's nitty-gritty, uh, rubber-meets-the-road counsel, there's still rich theology that he presents. So if we look at verses mm -hmm. 1 through 16 here, how would we kind of break that down, break it apart, sure. pull it apart? How, how does it fit nicely together? Well, verses 1 through 6 is a call to unity. And it has two sections. It, it has a, 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 a list, a, a discussion of attributes and actions that foster unity in the church. Okay. So he, he talks about humility and gentleness with patience, verse 2, bearing with one another in love, uh, and so on. But then in, in verses 4 through 6, it becomes more poetic or hymn-like. And he gives this list of seven ones, this wondrous list of seven ones. There is one body, counting them, that's number one, right? One of the sevens. There's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, there's number three, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and concluding appropriately enough, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Did, did we get all seven? That's all seven There's of them. Seven, and you know, the number seven has that sense of fullness, completeness, perfection. So one, 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 one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and, and so on. Uh, this is a, a, a beautiful, wonderful celebration of unity that we find in verses one through six. A call to unity, an announcement of unity. And, and perhaps, perhaps it's a good thing to pause right there for a moment, Eric, and um, talk about unity in these first six verses. Paul is, seems to be almost of two minds here. So it's clear that unity is a theological fact. He celebrates those in those sevens, right, those seven ones. There is not there might be, but there is one body, one spirit, and so on. One Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all. There, there's, he, he's celebrating this unity as a God-given fact, a theological truth. And sometimes I think we need to do more of that. We get worried about some spat that we're having in our local congregation over the color of the carpet in the new renovation, right? And, and we, we forget that, in fact, theological truth, blood bought by Christ on Calvary, we are one. That's right. That's right. And he's, he's helping us to, to revisit that. He or, is. or perhaps visit it for the first time for ourselves <laughs> if we've sensed some disunity. So in verses 1 through 6, there's a call to unity. Uh, what do we see in 7 to 16? Well, before we move there, looking at verse 3, you notice that while, while, it, while unity is a theological fact, Paul can say you need to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of faith. And the, the Greek verb for unity there is an energized word. I mean, you're, you, it's a theological fact. It is truth but you need to work hard to make it happen. Now, that seems a little bit, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't align quite right in our heads, but nonetheless, that's a, that's a fact. We, we are theologically divine fact, we are united, but we need to work zealously to actualize that unity that is God-given fact. I can only imagine that if, if more of us as Christians worked zealously to realize the theological fact, Imagine how different the church would be today yes. if, we, if we were able to find unity uh, as opposed to just hoping for it and wishing for it, as it were. Now, in the second major section of our passage, verses, four through, verses 7 through 16, uh, Paul is going to give us an image of the exalted Jesus as the giver of gifted people to his church. Okay? So hang on to that because... This is where it gets a little confusing. He cites a specific verse from Scripture, Psalm 68, 18. It's a complex passage with an ascent and descent and this, that, and the other going on. And it's easy to get a little lost. So hang on to, we should all hang on together this idea that 
in these, this second major section, he's giving us an image of the exalted Christ as the one who gives gifted people to his church. Okay, and we'll see how that works out. Okay, very good. So, what should we learn? I guess let me put it that way. What should we learn about the unity of the church from this passage that, we are, that we're pulling out here? It's God-given fact, theological truth, yet we need to work hard to help actualize it and, and help it come into being in our experience, in our local congregations, in our, in, in our city, and so on. And number three, that unity is enhanced by the gifted people that God places within the church. Their role, if they're playing the role the ascended Jesus wishes them to play, is to bind the church together, to help it be unified in its life and its witness to Jesus. So I'm going to make an assumption here, and I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with making the assumption, <laughs> that if God wants his church to be unified, he wants everybody to be a part of that work, of that message, of that understanding, of that body. Because if you have some who are agreeing to being a part of it and others who would just as soon uh, go along for the ride, as it were, we're not going to see that unity and we're not going to see the power and the strength, are we? No. So at the beginning and ending of this second half of our passage in verses four, 7 and verse 16, uh, Paul underlines a very important principle, and that is that every church member is gifted by Jesus. Everyone has a, some role in helping to bring this wonderful theological fact of unity into the congregation at hand, into the fellowship of the church every church member. And there are lots of different gifts, yes. uh, many different gifts, and not everyone has the right. same gifts. Right. Uh, I'm perfectly comfortable admitting the fact that I do not have the gift of song, of singing. <laughs> I'm not gifted in that area at all. Uh, hospitality, uh, speaking, maybe. But everybody has different gifts. Yes. And so we're going to talk about some of those gifts a little bit and see where different people can fit in, and, and we're going to look at at what Paul has to say about the unity of the church, those gifts, and, and what he, by the grace of God, wants to see happen in our churches. We're going to come back and look at that in just a moment. But before we do, I want to encourage you and remind you that in addition to the weekly studies that you are doing on the book of Ephesians, there is a companion book to this weekly study called Ephesians by Dr. John McVeigh. You can pick this up at itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop, and it will give you so much more. You do not want to miss the opportunity to pick up this companion book. You will be blessed by it. And it will help you in learning more about God's plan for your life. The beautiful letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, it is worth adding to your library, not just to look good on your shelf, but to really bless your heart and your soul. We're going to come back in just a moment as we continue looking at this week's lesson on the book of Ephesians. We'll be right back. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We're continuing our study of lesson number seven, looking at the unified body of Christ. 
And John, before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about this, this passage that, uh, that Paul quotes from Psalms here in verse number eight. And you mentioned some very interesting characteristics of this passage or this verse. What do we see here? Well, I believe that uh, studying the Old Testament passage is really the key to understanding the ascent and the descent and some of the complexity of the passage here. So if you go back to Psalm 68, verse 18, it's a passage describing Yahweh, the Lord, and it's describing him as, as is fairly frequent in the Old Testament literature, as the great warrior. So God is the great warrior stepping onto the stage of history to right wrongs and so on. And so here's the picture. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men. That's the picture. That's the snippet. Okay. Now, what's fascinating is that when Paul quotes the, the verse, he doesn't have the Yahweh Lord figure as receiving gifts but giving gifts. And that may be simply because uh, at the end of the passage, oh, verse 35, uh, God is giving gifts. So Paul may be drawing some things together in, in Psalm 68. But the picture here is a warfare picture. The Lord Yahweh has just won a great battle, a great war. And when you do that in the context of the, the ancient world, you ascend to the top of your capital city, because your city's probably on a, what we call a tell these days, right? You ascend to your capital city. So you ascended on high, meaning you ascended to your capital city. You led a host of captives in your train. So you've won this great victory. You have prisoners of war. Uh, you, you have a victory parade up to your city with these, with these captives behind you, testimony to the great victory that you've won and you receive gifts from people. You receive tribute from those you have conquered. You, you see the basic picture there. Now, Paul is reading Psalm 68, 18, just like he reads Psalm 8 and Psalm 110, and he's seeing here a prophecy of Jesus. And he believes that when Jesus ascended on high, he then gave gifts to his people. Okay, so Jesus has won on Calvary's tree an, a, a tremendous victory uh, over against what seems to be obvious. It wasn't a defeat. His death wasn't a defeat. Uh, uh, Colossians 2, verse 15, it was in fact a victory over the powers of darkness. And Jesus ascends to heaven, and from heaven, having been exalted, from heaven he gives gifts to his people. That's the basic picture. Okay. So we've got Jesus giving these gifts, and then Paul starts talking a little bit about some of these gifts. What do we see here? It identifies, Paul identifies for us in, in verses 11 and 12 of, uh, Ephes of chapter 4 of Ephesians. He identifies what the gifts were, right? And so in, in, in the verses 9 and 10 try to sort out the ascent and the descent. I think we follow the order of the psalm. In that case, the ascent comes before the descent. The ascent is Christ's ascent to the throne of God following his resurrection. The descent is Christ descending in the spirit at Pentecost to give gifts. Okay? Very good. Now, it, some of the translations don't help us because they insert a word, he first descended. But that word first is not in the Greek text. And so, I think we, we should track on the order that the psalm gives us. Exaltation, the ascent comes first with Christ's ascent following the resurrection, and the descent follows with Christ in his spirit descending at Pentecost. Very good. Okay, so then it says uh, in verse 11, and he gave, remember the, the ascended Christ is now from the heights, from the exalt, exaltation of heaven. He is pouring out his spirit. He is giving gifts. This would be Acts chapter 2 language, the end of Acts 2, verses 33 through 36. And he gave, or the gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, the particular Greek syntax there suggests that pastor, teacher are one group. 
So these are pastors slash teachers. Pastors who are teachers. Pastors who are teachers. Teachers who are pastors. They're, they're sharing this activity. Uh, so you have these four categories of what, what could be called ministers of the word, right? In some way or another, they're ministering God's word to people evangelistically, as a form of nurture, and so on. So they are ministers of the word. And the comparison with uh, 1 Corinthians 12 is interesting. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Spirit gives spiritual gifts to people. In Ephesians chapter 4, a little twist on the imagery here, uh, Jesus is the giver of the gifts. And he doesn't so much give spiritual gifts to people as he gives uh, gifted people to his church. You see the slight difference there? So he gives these people. Now, at that point, Eric, we have to ask ourselves, who are these people? Because we kind of think we know who some of these people are. We know who evangelists are, and we know who pastors are, and we kind of know who teachers are. Uh, but the categ our categories for those don't necessarily match precisely what Paul is thinking of in the first century and in Ephesus. This is in a day long before there were conference offices and paychecks and, you know, all of those things. Paul really here is highlighting local church leaders in the local house churches and those people who had these roles of sharing the word of God with their fellow members, of sharing the message of the gospel with the community and so on. So we, we ought not to think of these as some special class of people, clergy and so on. These are lay members of the church. These are church members who have added to their vocations of earning bread a role, God-breathed, God-ordained role. Which kind of makes sense if Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus mm -hmm. to let them know that these are some gifts that they can expect to see there in that local right. church. Right. Uh, makes, makes a whole lot of sense. And so Paul's going to work this out in the context of the body metaphor. And again, the body metaphor is similar in some ways to its presence in 1 Corinthians 12, and in some other ways it's, it's fairly different. So uh, in Romans 12, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the head is not distinguished as a particularly important part of the body. This is the first time, Colossians and Ephesians, where the head is identified. And here the head is be Christ. Is Christ, right? So the head is Christ. So that's, that's a little bit new. And then also here, these, these gifted people that we've just talked about are identified in the context of the body metaphor as ligaments or tendons. And so they're playing a, a role as connective tissue, right? Uniting the body, pulling everything together. The role of these ministers of the word ought to be, if, they're, if it's functioning well, it ought to be to help unify the church, actualize that unity, which is our God-given right and fact. I like the way you use the term, if it's functioning well. Yes, if it's functioning <laughs> because well. Because yes. there are ideals, and then there's the situation in which we find ourselves in the real world. Yes. And Paul kind of makes reference to something along those lines in verse number 14. Uh, in verse 14, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every this, that, and the other. The, in, in, the indication here is things aren't going 100% smoothly. Yep, yeah, this is a very idealistic letter, uh, but one has the sense that Paul chooses to be in that tone. He doesn't want to add to their being downhearted about what it means to be a Christian. So mostly he stays on a fairly idealistic plane. But this would be probably the principal place in the letter, chapter 4, verse 14, where he suggests there could be some issues. There apparently is some false doctrine floating around and, and so on. Don't be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried around by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness. There, there's a lot of different imagery that's, that's going on in, in verse 14. Someone has summarized all these, these metaphors that he's using this way. Stop being babies, <laughs> tossed high by waves and blown about by every gust of teaching in this sea of human trickery. Uh, that's kind of, it's quite an image, quite yeah, that, a set of images. That puts it down in, in, in our terms, in our language that we can understand. And we're, we're talking here this week about the unified body of Christ. And as you mentioned, Paul is being somewhat idealistic yes. about this. 
but we also recognize that he's dealing with reality in here. The reality for someone who's watching this, listening to this week's program right now, is they may, they may see a lack of unity, a lack of participation in perhaps their own local church. Sure. What words of encouragement would you give them to help buoy them up above the, the morass of reality, at least as they see it, and, and help them to see the exalted picture and the, the very realistic possibility that God desires for them to experience and be a part of in their church? I, I think our passage, uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, is, is really, really helpful for us here. I like the fact that verse 14 is there. It acknowledges the reality of less than perfect situations in local congregations. But again, Paul is going to point us to the wondrous theological realities. The fact that your congregation is haggling about um, this, that, or the other, the carpet and the renovation, or whatever it might be, is, is, a, is a kind of surface issue. And you can certainly acknowledge that surface issue in prayer before the Lord and say, you, you know this challenge in this issue. But thank you for helping us live into the true unity of the church. Thank you for bringing the power of the gospel to bear upon our church fellowship. So there's encouragement there. And we hope that you are encouraged. Uh, the reality is, not everything is perfect in Christ church, but the reality is also that everything is perfect in Christ Jesus. And when we take a look at his exalted status and his power and what he desires to do in the church and even in your local church, there should be hope. In fact, indeed, there is hope and a great deal of it. We're going to continue as we go through the book of Ephesians, seeing some very practical advice that Paul gives to those of us living today in the very closing hours of Earth's history so that we can be encouraged, we can be strengthened, we can be emboldened to be exactly what Jesus wants us to be. And in the remaining weeks as we study the book of Ephesians, we're going to see that in very, very clear ways. We trust that you've been blessed this week as we've looked at the unified body of Christ, and we look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. This has been Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written.